at exactly the minute I was told you would. Well, I, <laughs> no, the um, just and I, I apologize for being late, and I'm just so glad you're all here, and this is wonderful that you you set this up. And uh, I'm actually in the, as John Tracy knows, I'm in the uh, Democratic Senate campaign office because I'd have to use either uh, Marcel's uh, at home. I can't do it oh, as, yeah. on, on government property or all, but uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to get home in time. We just came from they probably told you a long meeting went a lot longer than we thought with uh, with the president and and the members of the democratic members of the uh, judiciary committee and uh which is actually kind of fascinating i think that the both the president and the vice president were there uh the president had been chair uh, of the uh Senate Judiciary Committee. I'd been chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Dick Durbin is there, is currently chair of the committee. Kamala Harris was a, had been a member of the committee. So it was, a, uh, it was a serious meeting, but one where it was like, oh, you remember that time? Oh, you mean that guy? Yes, wasn't that something? And if anybody had been listening, they say, what the hell are they talking about? But we all know what we're talking about. And the president was as impressive as I've seen him at, at anything because uh, we're talking about the first African American woman to go on the Supreme Court. A pledge he made at a, at a campaign debate where everybody else says, "Wow, well, you know, I want to think about it." He said, "I'll do it," and now he's going to do it. And I. Uh, you know, when you're, uh, I know how much it means in our family, in the history of it. As many of you know, uh, my son in law is African American. Two of our absolutely wonderful and cherished grandchildren, one of whom's named Patrick, mm-hmm. and another one's named Sophia, uh, are so thrilled to see the president doing this. And as am I, and I, I told him that. And um, it's interesting, a lot of times people do not see the human part of him. And uh, when um, uh, he was vice president, some of you were probably there when he came up for his um talking about the cancer program. We had the cancer moonshot. That was a moonshot. We had bre- a breakfast for him down in, uh, John, what's the name of the restaurant? Penny Clues. Yes, I, I, Lord knows I've eaten there enough times I should remember. I can see Mary Sullivan nodding, she knows. But <laughs> uh, the, um, he, he was, um, when we finished, we're running a little bit of time, time, but he went downstairs, no press or anything else, just, just shake hands with dishwashers and everybody else in there and thank them for it. That's lovely. But then uh, it was not long after Bo Biden had died and uh, Marcel and I rode up with him to, to the uh, UVM and she asked him how he was doing. And... Uh, um, he just waved the Secret Service out of the car. The three of us just sat there. <clears throat> it's emotional, just like I've just held hands and uh, shed a tear because we, we, Marcel and I had known Bo from the time he was a child and, and the friendship. And uh, when, uh, when Marcel was undergoing the first part of her chemotherapy on her most recent uh, cancer treatment, it's um, uh, and she had a particularly rough week of chemo. We were back at the farm in Vermont, and phone phone rings. Hey, Ron, the phone rings, and then 
and it's Jill Biden. Oh. She just called a chair up, and wow. conversation went like I could hear myself say, "Oh, Jill, you remember the time? Oh, yeah, that was you know, back and forth. They were completing each other's sentences. She was laughing her head off after Marcel was, and then a couple of days later, the phone rings. Marcel's Joe, how you doing? Uh, they're real people. Anyway." I want to thank you for doing this. I want to thank you for the support you've given Marcel and I over the years. I cannot tell you how touched uh, we both were when uh, the notes and letters and, and calls and all we got after uh, uh, when I made my announcement that I decided to come home. I I did get a kick out of one of the editorial cartoons. Showed two farmers in a field, especially in Vermont, and they're looking up the sky at an evening sky. Here's a bat signal, <laughs> and it uh, said, "I think it's calling Senator Leahy home." <laughs> uh, you're you're the one who makes it a home worthwhile, and I tell you, uh, everything, everything you've done to help over the years. From when I first ran an impossible race, I still keep on my wall of my office about the only things from the press I've kept about myself. And two headlines, five days apart, big bold type, front page of the paper. First one says, poll dooms Leahy. And a poll... <laughs> I was 35 points behind uh, five days before the election. The next one, same size type, same front page, lay unexpectedly. <laughs> <laughs> well, by Jesus and Crow, I didn't fire much unexpected. <laughs> but that's because so many of you worked. And that's the only way it does. I mean, uh, if we're going to have a party that means something, we all have to get out. We all have to work. We all have to, at, at every single level. So I will hush up, and I, I like to I like to hear from you. And Madam Chair, you, it's all yours. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep it short and sweet because, um, first of all, Senator Leahy is probably the Vermonter who least needs an introduction, and he certainly doesn't need an introduction for us loyal Democrats. However, I'm gonna give one anyway, cause I just can't resist. I'm gonna give a really short one. I'm just gonna share a few highlights. Uh, Senator Leahy was elected as Vermont's first Democratic Senator in 1975. And he's currently the longest serving Senator in the US. We all know that you, Senator Leahy will go down in history of, as one of the most respected and influential senators ever. And it wasn't just in one area. You have touched every area of life, not just for Vermonters, but for Americans. You served as chair of, of appropriations, agriculture, and the judiciary committees, where you worked as an effective and powerful advocate for women's rights, for the environment, for farmers, for families, for workers, for clean air and water. The, the list is, is pretty much endless. And you made a tremendous impact here in Vermont, where you've championed innumerable programs and causes, from healthcare to LGBTQ rights, to children's services, mental health, protecting Lake Champlain. And I could go on and on, but of course I won't. I just have to share one personal anecdote. Anybody who has been in Vermont any time at all has their own personal anecdote. We could spend the whole time listening to all of us share them, but I'm chair, I get to share mine. And I just want to say that I will never forget, and there are many of you on this call who will never forget, when at the 2017 Women's March, you and Marcel, I don't know how you wrangled this big building house that you opened up to hundreds of us Vermonters. It was kind of a cool, miserable day. It was January. And we came in by the hundreds. And you welcomed us all with bagels and cream cheese and coffee and orange juice and uh, many, many hugs. That was in the before times back. I, I don't know how you've managed 
senator without giving hugs because that is kind of a trademark. But um, I can tell you that, you know, raise your hand if you were there. There were several of us there who I know will never forget that. I I have other anecdotes I can share, but I would rather hear from you. So um, we are now going to move on. Um, You know, given the meeting that you just came from, the first question that we just have to ask is, um, how about a little update on where we are with the Supreme Court nominations? We won't tell. I'll, yeah, I'll go to that in just a moment, but that meeting and the uh, the uh, Women's March and uh, I think Marcella just had surgery, but she still marched for a couple of miles with you, as did I, and our daughter and granddaughter were marching there. And, but that you were in the Mott House. I'd rented it out. Before that, I said, you know, there could be 30 or 40 people. Cut. Well, it was many times that. And uh, fortunately, I had a couple of young staff people. I said, here, take my credit card and go over to <laughs> Union Station. Just buy as many big things of coffee, donuts. Any particular guy, I said, whatever they had, just just buy it and uh, sign, sign the bill and bring it back, which they did. And... It was a cold enough day. It tasted darn good. That uh, was such an inspiring start to the march for all of us Vermonters to be there and welcomed by you and Marcel was just, un- it, was, it was no one who was there will ever forget that. But you know what I, what I got a kick out of? Uh, our daughter was marching with a woman who uh, had been one of her best friends in high school. And she had her uh, young daughter there, as, as did uh, Alicia. The girls are about the same age, uh, one white and blonde, the other one black and dark, and they're holding arms. And I heard one say to their mother, look at us, <clears throat> we all, <clears throat> excuse me, I get emotional thinking, so look at us, we all look alike. Oh. And and it with it's interesting. I was talking to the police because of course we had the um, the inauguration the day before. And all that, and they were all out there, and they said this is such a different the crowd. Everybody's happy and respectful and happy, and uh, so. I mentioned that because that actually came up. It's amazing you mentioned that actually came up in our conversation. I'm going to be careful what I say about the conversation because it was private with the president and and the members of the uh, um, Judiciary Committee. But I think we one point we made to all of us that whether uh, how important it was to make such a mark in history, a woman and a woman of color on the Supreme Court. And I'm sitting there with Kamala Harris on one side of me, Maisie Hirono from Hawaii, and both of them saying how much it meant to them personally. And you could feel it. But then everybody else there, the comments that came, uh, and we have members around the country saying how proud we were the president of doing this. Now important because, frankly, the Supreme Court has become too politicized and it loses, you lose all the respect that you might have uh, for it. And if that happens, the whole country suffers. Um, when I was in Law school at Georgetown, those of us who were in the top 5% of the class, they had a special uh, luncheon with the members of the Supreme Court. And there are different tables. You just pulled out, name at random, you sat with them. And Marcel and I ended up sitting with Hugo Black, who had been, uh, uh, you know, probably a Ku Klux Klan member. 
very good friend of, uh, he, he referred to Franklin the first couple of times he referred to Franklin. I suddenly realized he was talking about Franklin Roosevelt and uh, how uh, Franklin had appointed him to the court. He also talked about coming to Vermont. He had no idea was going, we were going to be at this table. We talked about coming to Vermont and uh, remembered exactly where he went, who the candidates were, and what the vote was. Uh, decades before, I went over to the Library of Congress and checked on this for day, and he was right. <laughs> but uh, he said they took two and a half years to do Brown versus Board of Education, the desegregation bill that overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. The reason it took two and a half years, Earl Warren wanted a unanimous court because it was going to be so jarring to many segments of our country. I mean, desegregation is normal to us now, but at that time it wasn't in many parts of the country. And he wanted the Supreme Court to speak in but one voice. So there'd be the respect of the court in in the uh, vote. And I mentioned that I hear it because at our meeting, because today that these five to four decisions, the respect is going. Um, I talked to Justice Breyer just before he made his announcement and then um, he called Marcel and myself as he was leaving the White House where he made the announcement and to say that he had made the same point, you've got to have something bring us back. Uh, so we discussed some names, which I, I won't go into. I, uh, the list that he has are all extremely qualified people. And uh, some I, I know, others I've been reading the background. Uh, I think he's wise, be wise to make the uh, nomination soon. Uh, he'll meet with them. He's, he, the list of names won't go out because, and I understand why he doesn't want, if somebody doesn't get every, most, just about every name that we discuss could, well, in fact, all of them are eminently well qualified to be in the Supreme Court. But he doesn't want to have a list of, here's the five, my short list, and here's the one I picked and have people say to the other four, well, what did you do wrong? Because they're all qualified. Uh, and I think uh, the names he had, if he had slots, they could all go on, on the Supreme Court. But we also face the possibility and I've been in meetings on this today, which I, and we talked about it tonight, but I, you can imagine the nature of some of the closed door meetings. I am very, very concerned about Ukraine. I'm very concerned about a war there and the ripple effect and that coming at the same time. Uh, we have a lot of Americans in Ukraine. Uh, the, when you look but well, just what you've seen on television, the satellite pictures of the uh, Russian buildup. If you think that's something, you should see some of the, of our satellite mm. pictures. It, it's terrifying. And uh, so there's a lot on his plate, but uh, This last time, as Carolyn Dwyer knows, I believe she's on here. Yep. And and John Tracy knows. I uh, six years ago, I went back and forth with her run again, and I thought that, like many others did, that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to win, and thought, well, I'd be somebody I could work with, and. Um, size of seniority on appropriations would help Vermont. And I must admit it was a little bit, I was, I was questioning myself and I see John smiling. I questioned, uh, he'd write around the state with me here. What the hell am I doing here with Donald Trump? Uh, <laughs> which, uh, uh, but 
uh, I was glad I was there because there were some of his worst things we could stop. And with uh, President Biden, because of our long friendship, it, it has been good. I, I did say, um, oh, certainly after he was there, he invited a few senators down. We're in the Oval Office. And he said, well, you know, Pat's, Pat's been, was here a lot when Barack and I were here. And sure, with your seniority, you were down here with Trump. I said, well, no, not really. I said, I was invited down to the White House several times for meetings when Donald Trump was here. But I had a conflict each, each day and I couldn't go. Oh, on the way out, Kamala Harris says, Pat, what was your conflict? I said, it was the day I was having my hair done. <laughs> <laughs> the two of them just grabbed me and we're, we're rocking back and forth all laughing our heads off. And uh, the press is, what, what were you saying? What was the joke? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> so now you know what the joke was. Oh, boy. Yeah, that was some long, long but, years you you lasted there. So, so I'll, I'll stop talking. I don't want to. We have, we have plenty of other questions. And I, I love to hear your answers because you know, you, you have such depth and breadth of experience. It, it's, it, yeah, it, it's really great. Um, here's a good one. Can you weigh in on Mitch McConnell's, on uh, Senator McConnell's criticism of the RNC's censure of Senators Cheney and Kinziger and the implication of this di deep rift in the Republican party? That's an excellent question. Um... You have to understand, I've known Mitch McConnell for decades. Mitch is always playing the long game. This doesn't necessarily mean this is his philosophy, but uh, he just wants to stay in power. And he knows that, uh, he knows the RNC made a really stupid mistake. In fact, the first thing they get came out, they even had a typo on it. <laughs> but uh, he knows it was a stupid, stupid mistake. They could come back and hurt them in the elections. So he doesn't care whether they're censoring or not. He just wants to do what will protect his party hmm. in a, a general election. It's not necessarily philosophical. He knows, he knows that... Uh, Trump helped instigate that mob. He knows that it was violent crime. I mean, he was there. Right. I mean, we were there smelling the smoke yeah. uh, and, and the tear gas and everything else. I remember walking on the, on the floors outside, how slippery they were from the fire extinguishers and, oh. and everything else. Uh, and I remember police officers with machine guns coming on the Senate floor, rushing us off. So he knows how bad it was, but he would, but he wouldn't vote for impeachment. You know, he'll, he's going to play whatever it's the long game. So, but the criticism is, is right. It was, uh, and I, I would have criticized the Democratic Party if they just said so stupid, but you never do. So, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Our next question is from a fan of yours, Melinda Moulton. Oh, uh, I'm a fan of hers. <laughs> <laughs> and she's blowing you kisses right now. So um, great to see you tonight, Senator Leahy. And thank you so much for your years of tremendous service for all Vermonters, says Melinda. As you know, Vermont has just port put forth Prop 5, which is our Reproductive Liberty Amendment. In November, if voters vote to support this amendment, it will then become part of Vermont's constitution. Can you f confirm that this will protect reproductive liberty in Vermont, even if Roe v. Wade is overturned and or the federal government takes aim under a more fascist leadership to abolish this liberty for women across the nation? Great question for the- uh, It's a superb question. And the answer is yes, we, we, our law will, uh, our law will, uh, carry that, but there's also before Roe versus Wade, there was a case 
brought um, by the then state's attorney of Chittenden County. Uh, they went up to the Vermont Supreme Court because uh, uh, to say that our law was ambiguous and abortion should be allowed within a medical context. I was the state's attorney. <laughs> and that went up and be, it was a unanimous conservative Vermont Supreme Court that ruled with me hmm. and said that uh, in effect, Roe versus Wade, before Roe versus Wade came wow. down, that was Leahy versus Barrett or Barlow, I'm trying to think of the name of the doctor, but we, we, we put a declaratory judgment case. And then um, the then Attorney General of Vermont uh, got involved, although I brought it as, as state's attorney. And I remember uh, after they ruled and basically established the law in Vermont, which is the same thing the Constitutional Amendment will do. Um, they, the Attorney General was criticized by um, Right to Life group that was based in Rutland, his, where he's from. And so he moved to uh, uh, have them reconsider the case. Hmm. And um, they asked me, they said, Mr. State's Attorney, what do you what do you say? I said, Well, Chief Justice, I, I gave you the all the cases that would uphold our restrictive laws, but then I as as I do as state's attorney, but as an officer of the court, my duty was also to show you all the laws that say Vermont is wrong. And that's the way mm. you ruled. And the state's attorney of Chittenden County has no objection to it. <laughs> and he turns to the attorney general and said, have you found new law that isn't <laughs> considered in state's attorney's brief? Uh, uh, no. Are the new facts? Or, no. Bang. We're affirmed. And they walk across the That's bench. a I great thought, memory to share. I thought Gee whiz, I kind of uh, like being state's attorney. <laughs> and but you were ahead of your time. Linda, I didn't like it so much, I, I stayed as state's attorney. <laughs> yeah. No, you, you found another you found another path to your, to your liking. That's wonderful. Um, next, an, another very light issue here. Can you talk about your position on the filibuster and if there's any movement from Senators Cinema and Manchin? I've... Uh... I think I'm the only senator there has voted three times to uh, uh, cut back the effect of the filibuster. In fact, I know I am. Beginning when I was first there and working with a young senator from Minnesota who spent a lot of time with Fritz Mondale and uh, was on the floor sometimes at one o'clock in the morning trying to, trying to change that. Uh, and the we ought to have real votes on, on these things. I think the, uh, uh, for example, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. This Voting Rights Act, I mean, his first signed law by it was a President Nixon, and President Reagan, President George H. W. Bush, the Reagan and Bush ones. I was there for the signing. And I forgot what the vote was. It was like 98 to zero or 100 to nothing in the in the Senate. I mean, you can't get a 98 to zero vote in the Senate today to say the sun rises in the East. <laughs> but it should not be a, a question. And it's, uh, uh, we'll keep trying. Uh, I, yes, I, there shouldn't be a, a filibuster on that. The, you shouldn't be voting to stop people from voting. And that's an oversimplified answer, but it's, uh, it's the way I feel. And that, that is a 
as Senator Leahy answer, I'm not at all surprised to hear. Thank you. We have a question from Asher Edelson, who happens to be our a new member of our executive committee. What do you think should be done regarding social security disability recipients who cannot continue to receive their benefits if they get married? This is an affront to marriage equality. I would like to see action in Congress. Yeah, I have, um, I have heard about that from others and I asked they, them to find out, um, I'm not on the committee that would handle that, but um, I, I don't think that shows the basic intent of what social security should be. If you're a disability recipient, you should be able to continue to get it whether you're married or not. I, uh, uh, and I, I saw the question come in um, and I've asked, I've asked the staff to talk with the finance committee and those that handle so social security and see whether something is there on that. I mean, that, that sounds like it should be a no brainer. Thanks. And, and it, wouldn't add to, it wouldn't add to cost. Um, they're getting a disability right anyway and so yeah well th thanks for uh, checking in on that and I know that Asher will be very eager to to hear what you find out let's take a question from the chat box I think that there probably are a couple that came in um who's monitoring that who can share that um hi Ann I've been yes. monitoring and it doesn't Great. look like there have been any that have come in okay well that's fine because we have plenty more that already came in. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't hear what was said. I, I guess there isn't a question in the chat box. So if you want to ask a question, you can you can still put one in, but we have a few more. Um, we have a, another fan of yours, Senator, uh, uh, another fan of uh, the Senator, Billy Gosh. Has a oh, question. golly, yes. Uh, have you and Marcel, oh, this is a, this is a nice one. This is a little change. I'm, I'm glad to see this. Have you and Marcel thought about how you want to spend your time, uh, you know, once you come home? Would a large volume of your beautiful photographs taken over the years be in the future? I think there might be quite a uh, call for that. Sent with much affection to you and Marcel. Uh, that, that, that means a lot. And I'll tell Marcel uh, about that. As you know, when we've been at your home, we've Thoroughly enjoyed it. You've seen I've always had a camera with me. In fact, President Biden said to me today, he said, Pat, where's your camera? <laughs> there and he is. I've got a couple of pictures of him in his private meeting in here. Um, the I do have a book coming out this summer. Uh, mm. It's called The Road Taken. You know, the uh, Robert Frost uh, yeah. with two roads. I took the one less taken. That's made all the difference. And, uh, and that's going to have some of my photographs. That's a great Vermont title. But then I want to go to, I want to then do a further one of just photographs. My son-in-law, um, Lawrence Jackson, was Barack Obama's photographer. He's now... Kamala Harris's, wow. and he wrote a uh, photograph, uh, or, or he wrote a photography book of that, and President Obama wrote, wrote the foreword. Uh, several other people wrote parts of it, and one, one of his photographs I have hanging in my office, which um, President Obama liked the most, is Obama from the back of his head. Hmm. A little girl who uh, daughter of people worked for him and they were going overseas, came in for photograph. And she's obviously African-American. She's reached up her arms and he picked her up, you know, a little child would just cuddle in like this. And she's so happy. It's the back of Obama's uh. head. But on the wall looking at them is Abraham Lincoln. And uh Barack told me that especially the photograph was taken by an African-American, my son-in-law. And he had, it, he had it blown up about the size of a card table outside his office. And a friend, a, a friend of ours who 
Marlon, he uses the, and I, this has a terrible name dropping, and I apologize, but you've got to see the book, uh, um, the uh, Yes, We Did, hmm. and you'll see this in there. Uh, a friend of mine, Marlon, was so captivated by it. He knew, knows the, our kids. They've been with him a lot. He calls, he called Lawrence and asked me if he'd have a copy of it. Lawrence sent him one. So if you ever go in Bono's house in Dublin, uh, or, or as the other members of you two are in there meeting, you will see that picture on his wall. Or come to my office. <laughs> and, and Billy, some of these, I have so many uh, fun pictures. I, uh, we asked, our archivist is going through them. I said, I must have thousands. He said, how many hundred thousands? I said, <laughs> yeah. I said oh, you're kidding. I said, oh, no. Uh, and some of, wow. You know, some of them are, um, uh, I went to, Tibet, I led the first congressional uh, Senate delegation to Tibet. It took us several years to negotiate it. Brought Bob Stafford with me. And uh, the pictures I, I got out of there are the only pictures you've seen in the in the portal where the where the uh, Dalai Lama fled. Mm -hmm. They have signs and no no photographs allowed. The head monk came up to me and said, uh, his Holiness is your, you and your wife are friends of his, and you like to take photographs, take them. So I started snapping photographs. The Chinese secret police were pulling, started pulling out their camera, and he said, and we heard this from our, one of our translators, um, no photographs are allowed in here. If you take photographs, we'll destroy your cameras. They said, well, well he's taking photographs, <laughs> and I call it my Zen moment as I click it, but he looks at me and goes, no, he's not. <laughs> uh, well, I think the hardest part of uh, putting that book together is going to obviously be cho choosing which of the, you know, from the many, many years and many, many memories. It's going to take you a long time to go through those. Too. You know, some of the nicest memories, though, are uh, pictures I've taken of Marcel, the pictures I've taken of uh, our children pictures of our grandchildren and they love them. Now they say, I look like that when I was that age. And, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's, these are memories. We'll have time. We'll have more time for, for yeah. memories. Yeah. Yeah. And although I don't, I don't intend to just sit on a back porch. <laughs> I don't think any of us could imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not in, not at all. One thing we do like to do uh, is go scuba diving. We will be able to do that more. And we love going cross-country skiing and snowshoeing up at our farm in uh, Middlesex. And until Marcel finishes the her chemos, we've been very careful not to put her on the plane or do things like that. Um, although all the prognosis is perfect to Looking forward to about six weeks being able to ring the bell as she goes out. But the, the chemo knocks out your uh, immunity system. So she, even though she'd been vaccinated, she's going to, um, once they tell her, and they'll tell them the bone marrow uh, right. test, once they tell her she can be revaccinated, she said, or I'm, their sleeve's going to be rolled up. She said, take it right now. We're not anti vaxxers in our family. Yeah, no, I, I didn't figure. <laughs> we have a question from the chat box. Claire, do you want to share that? Or Kate? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have a question from Charlotte McGray. And Charlotte is asking, can you speak to the way that Medicare Advantage Healthcare disadvantages the elderly? I understand they have no real supervision and they often have poor tactics. Yeah, um, there are a lot of people who have healthcare because of, of Medicare and Medicaid and wouldn't otherwise. But I think of what a 
we are better than some countries, but we are nowhere near as good as others. I'm thinking of things like prescription drugs and whatnot. The, uh, uh, if you have insurance and you've got a decent salary, some of these drugs you can afford. Too many people, they're life-saving drugs. If they lived in Canada, if they lived in uh, Ireland, where else they could buy them for a fraction of what they buy them here. Those are things that have to be changed. But again, uh, I'm not trying to duck the question. I, I know there's some very good people on the finance committee who are working on this. And I'm just hoping that we could extend or expand our major, uh, majority in the Senate for next year, because I think with a majority of Democrats in the Senate and a president who understands this, I think you see changes. I, I wish I could say, hey, here's what's going to happen, both point A, B, C, but your, your, your question is, is excellent and it's real. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here, here's, a, here's a kind of uh, looking at the long view. Um, I like this question. Ta the top three things that you are most proud of, professionally and or personally. Well, I mean, this may almost sound cliche. I'm most proud to be a Vermonter. Both Marcel and I were born in Vermont. My um, Italian grandparents emigrated to Vermont. My mother was born in Vermont. My father was. Um, the Leahy's came to Vermont around the 1850s, the Irish side of the family. I was proud that my parents, I mean, my father had to leave school when he was 13 because mm -hmm. my grandfather, Patrick J. Leahy, died as a stone carver in Barry. And dad became a self-taught historian. Uh, so good that when our kids were in college, they, they had a test come that they called Grandpa Leahy to double check things. Mm -hmm. But uh, I became the first Leahy to get a college degree. My sister Mary was the second one. And I, I am proud of that. I'm proud of the family I had. Uh, I'm the happiest that um, as a 19 year old college student, I remember being at a family gathering with other friends in Burlington. And I was flirting with a 17 year old, just graduated from high school and going to nurses school. And I could hear her talking in French to her mother about me, and I thought she was ignoring me, and I was heartbroken. But um, <laughs> we'll celebrate our 60th anniversary uh, this summer. That is something to be proud of. It is, you know, and it, and and I, I can honestly say, I never could have done all these things without Marcel. We were talking about uh, John and I and some others, and so sort of the flashbacks. Um, there was an article, was in Digger or Seven Days or anything, about a, an airplane that took off in 1973, a Delta air flight to Burlington, Vermont, uh, to uh, Boston from Burlington, stopped in New Hampshire to pick up some other passengers. When it got to uh, Boston, it, it hit the uh, seawall versus the flames, everybody died, everybody. I two survived the crash, died injuries. I, I mentioned this because I, um, the state's attorney's office at that time, was, I, I, there were two of us in there and I had been trying cases for three weeks, briefing Supreme Court cases, called out at two and three, four o'clock in the morning for um, deadly crimes and things of that nature. So I got about three, three or four weeks and virtually no sleep. And I was supposed to go to Houston 
because I was on the executive board of the National DA's Association. It's going to fly to Boston and then go to Houston. And Marcel said, uh, you know, the rest of the board is going to be meeting in New York in a couple of weeks. You're going to be at that. It's a much easier trip. Mm -hmm. You haven't any time off. Why don't you stay at the farm? Why don't you stay at the farm Ugh. with the kids? So I, I, the state police were going to pick me up and give me a ride to the airport. I called them because they didn't have to. Long story short, we're sitting there on the front lawn. Cruisers, state, we're on a dirt road. State police cruiser pulls up. Guy looks out, stops, jumps out, runs up, and says, "You're okay." I said, "Of course I'm okay. What, what's the matter?" He said, "Well, you, you were going to be on the airplane this morning." I said, "No, I, 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 I canceled the, my flight uh, uh, last night and told the dispatcher you had to pick me up." He said, "Well, didn't you hear what happened?" And he told me. That could have changed. Um, that could have changed a lot, but um, and I, I credit her with that. But on pro professionally, you know, I enjoyed being state attorney. I enjoyed trying cases. I uh, I enjoyed making changes in in Vermont law. We talked about the prelude to uh, Roe versus Wade, but also helped to establish the state police. Uh, uh, school in, in Vermont and dramatically improved the uh, standards. And but going in the Senate, you know, one of the things that has impressed me the most, the people I work with in my own office, and I'm not just saying it's because John Tracy, who's run my Vermont office like nobody ever could, is on, on this. But these are some of the brightest men and women I've ever worked with. Every day I go to uh, work on private, I get briefings from, I mean, some are obviously classified, but others are open on what's happening, what, uh, what's before the uh, Congress. And it's like being in graduate school every day and learning something new. And, uh, I'll get 100 pages, 200 pages of briefing material a day. It's all fascinating. And the people who work with them. I've served with 20% of the people who've been in the U.S. Senate in uh, the history of the country. Wow. <laughs> there's, been 19, well, there's been 1,900 or so senators. <laughs> Keep in mind, the first, first Congress only had uh, 26, but... Uh, 15, uh, I mean, uh, 1,900, approximately 1,900. That's a great statistic. That, that's and amazing. I, I served with 400 of them. Now, some were there just for a few weeks. But I served with 400 of my distinguished colleagues, and I could tell you some are a hell of a lot more distinguished than others. Uh, <laughs> I, I worry that some of the giants in both the Republican and Democratic Party that I've seen in the past, we don't see anymore. And I, I worry for the Senate because the Senate is supposed to be the conscience of the nation. And uh, I'm most proud of always trying to speak to that conscience. Uh, when uh, I look at a number of things where I was the one vote that made a difference. And I've, I've never regretted that uh, because I, Followed my conscience. That's wonderful. I, I love that when you recall your pride in your professional accomplishments, that the first thing you talked about was, you know, more than 48 years ago was what you did for Vermont in Vermont. And that's that 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 says a lot, I think, that for all that you've touched and so much you've done in these 48 years, that that's still fresh in your mind, how you made a difference. As uh, as you know, Vermont's where we're from, and I, I think of the difficult and lives my parents and grandparents had in Vermont and how that's evolved. I think of the things that um, I, I think of my my father looking for a job to support his mother and his. The sister and the signs were no Irish need apply or 
you couldn't quite wow. figure that out. It's no Catholic reply. But how, how we have changed. Look how we have evolved as a state and how much different it is. Um, I, I mean, Vermont is home. I, I get homesick when I'm gone for more than that, more than a couple of weeks. And the last few weeks in negotiating every evening, seven days a week on the appropriations bills, I'm like, ready to tear out what little bit of hair I got left. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're, you, we're nearing the end. I have just a couple more questions. Go ahead. And I'll, 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 I'll go easy on you. Who is or was your political role model and why? Well, there were, there were a number of mine. I know one, one of the first senators I ever met as a child was Ralph Flanders. And then I, we don't think much of him, but he was the, or read much of him, but he was a quintessential Republican. And he was the one who came in and told Joseph McCarthy, I'm filing a motion of censure against you. And uh, wow. even, even Dwight Eisenhower didn't want to touch a member of his own party like that. He had the courage to do it. Yeah. And in his book, he talked about how he thought McCarthy was just a, a joke. And then he went home and um, down, down the southern part of the state. And his kids were at a group they all met with. Uh, and he asked them to come to the meeting. And they told him how terrified they were at their age of seeing this red baiting and everything else. And he said, okay, I'll stop it even though wow. he, he knew it hurt him with his own party, he did it. And I, I've always thought if you're willing to stand up, stand up like that. Uh, and I, I, I must admit that I've been there for about three months in the Senate. I was temporarily on the Armed Services Committee. I was a junior most member. And they had to vote to re, um, reauthorize the war in Vietnam, which they all, always did. No Vermont senator or House member had ever voted to stop the war in Vietnam. They might have criticized it, but they, every time they came to a vote, they always voted to keep it going. Our polls even showed that the majority of people in Vermont supported the war in Vietnam at that time. Hmm. Certainly the Free Press uh, editorialized for it and told me if I voted to uh, vote against the war, they would make sure I never got reelected. And it wow. came down to one vote, one vote, and I voted no. And they did the vote over again four times in between the president was calling me the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and I just kept voting no, and I was getting calls from wow. political and press leaders in Vermont saying that this, boy, am I going to be a one-term senator? <laughs> and now, now it'd be hard to find anybody who's in favor of the war in Vietnam, and I wasn't a one-term senator. <laughs> no, and that help. is just a marvelous example of what you talked about, about standing on your principles and, and knowing that it might hurt you in the end. But um, I, I know about that. Um, that. That was at the beginning of your tenure. You, ta you cast that tie-breaking vote, and uh, that, that went down in history very early on for you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we only have a couple more minutes. So I'm going to ask you uh, this question that came in that, um, that wasn't even on the list, but I, I know you could come up with an answer. And this is J Jim Ramsey from uh, Chair of Bennington County. He said, man, you I see have to down there. Nice cap, Jim. <laughs> he said, you have to ask Senator Leahy, are you going to reprise your cameo role in the Batman movies? Well, I'm not intimidated by thugs. <laughs> <laughs> the, last, the last Batman movie, we had talked about it, and um, but they filmed it in England. Then COVID hit, and the schedule started to stop, started to stop flying. Thing, and Marcel was just trying the chemo. And I said, there's no way I'm going to take a chance to do it. One of the reasons I've loved doing it uh, just because 
as a photographer to see how they do this photography is fascinating. I spend mm. more time talking to the photographers <laughs> than I do the uh, others. But also they pay a whole lot of money and I give every cent of it to the Children's Library in Montpelier at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Um, I uh, had my first library card there when I was oh. four, year, four years old. Oh, and that's great. I, you know, I read all of Dickens and, uh, and uh, Mark Twain and so on. And I just love that library, but it was in the basement. Now it's a big wing on the, those of you from Montpelier know it's, uh, you got that beautiful granite building and this wing of, of it. And I'll just close with this one, one, one story. You talk about Batman. I was, as I do sometimes volunteer to, because uh, we live in Middlesex, it's just five miles away to uh, read to children on Saturday morning. So I'm there in jeans and sweatshirt and I'm reading a story and somebody hands me a note and I said, this is terrible, terrible. <laughs> so well, what's the matter? I said, Batman's enemies hid their pictures in the library. And I can't figure the clues. I said, I need help. I grabbed my cell phone. I said, are you nearby? Oh, that's I, I need some help. The door opens and a burst of smoke in walks Batman. Oh. Her eyes are like this. <laughs> well, Batman couldn't figure out the the uh, clues, but the children did. Oh, that's where we keep the books on history and they find this and that's where we, so I, Those kids are never going to so, forget that. So he's, he's going out, he said, I want to thank you, children. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Batman. Oh, that <laughs> it was, was I thought, okay. All the long hours and other things, it was fun. That is just great. I, I hope to be in the one the next one after it, because it'll just buy that many more books for the Children's Library. We'll be watching for it. Thank and uh, Senator, uh, it's now, uh, the, the time is up. We so appreciate you coming. Thank and you. I couldn't say thank you to you any better than I see Annie Stratton. I'm gonna read you what she wrote in the chat box, because I think we're, we all feel this way. It's nice to get a more personal look at Senator Leahy to see him as a neighbor with a life that is beyond the Senate and politics. I value very much learning about that as it helps me to understand better how and why he has been a successful in Washington, DC. I also like the little background bits about his work. The rest we will read in books, but this sense of him as a fellow Vermonter is priceless. Thank you. That means no one so could have said it better. Thank you, Annie. And thank you so much, Senator Leahy. We really and I'll, and I'll tell Marcel because I couldn't have done this without her. Thank you all very, very much. Beautiful. Wonderful. Have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.